beginning at verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of the law. Now it is evident that no one is reckoned as righteous before God by the law. For the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You know, when I planned this worship service, I got lots of feedback. Everyone kept questioning me, wondering what I was up to. Why are we singing a Christmas song in the middle of June? Came back every time, there must be something wrong, over and over. We plan in advance, so this dribbled out over the past two or three weeks. Got something wrong here. Got something left over from Christmas here. Even when we were getting the slides uploaded, there's a question. There must be something wrong. This slides, this song's not supposed to be here. We had a lot of fun conversations over that. I said, no, no, that's what we want to do. We want to remember the excitement of Christmas six months later, and here we are. I want us to take a moment and capture that vision of Mary laying her baby boy in that manger, laying him on that pile of rags for him to sleep there in that manger. You know, during Christmas season, we talk a lot about Jesus. We talk about, a lot about the birth of Jesus. But then we spend the rest of the year talking about the last three years of his life. We don't talk much about what happened in between. You know, Jesus' mother Mary she didn't just give birth to him as hard as that, as that had to be, beyond my imagination. My daughter's the only one that I was allowed to tell, I know just how you feel, because I have no fear of her. As hard as that had to be, Mary did a whole lot more. She invested 30 years in raising him, nurturing him. We don't get a lot of stories about those times, do we? Those 30 years are kind of a mystery to us. My guess is it's probably not the kind of times, the kind of experiences that lend themselves to write stories about. It was ordinary, balanced, very human, very beautiful, wonderful times. And that relationship between Jesus and Mary, his mother, is revealed in all of the Gospels. I think it's kind of sad that we only think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, at Christmas time. Now, a few weeks ago, in our comparative religion class, we talked about this, how the Roman Catholics actually pray to Mary and the confusion that brought to us, because we don't understand it that way. And then we went on to say, but you know, sometimes maybe we take it too far the other way. Sometimes maybe we don't give her the respect and the time and the encouragement for the time that she spent investing in his life. Underappreciated, underappreciated in her role as the mother of Jesus. It's not really clear to us what Mary knew about her son and his divine nature, but when we look at the Gospels, especially the first two chapters, chapters of Luke, it's clear that Mary knew her son was meant to be the Messiah the Holy One of Israel, the promise, Emmanuel, God with us. In the Apostles' Creed, Mary is one of three pe people that are mentioned by name. Of course, Jesus is mentioned by name. And then we have Pontius Pilate, the villain of the ages. He's chosen to be the bad guy. And Mary, the mother of Jesus. When we meet Mary in Scripture, she's a teenage Jewish girl, probably around 14, maybe 15 years old. She's engaged 
to marry a young carpenter named Joseph. Likely an arranged marriage. The scripture kind of points that out to us. But I'm sure they had dreams, dreams of a home, dreams of a family. But God had other plans, didn't he? So one day in this town of Nazareth, something very, very strange happened. God sent the angel Gabriel with a message. And Gabriel comes to Mary and says, God sent me here to tell you, I got a job for you. And it's going to disrupt your entire life. That's how it goes, isn't it? Isn't that how it works? God's got a calling on our lives. We have this encounter with Christ, and our life is never the same again, is it? Don't have time to go into the full story, but I want to mention someone to you. Her name is Katie Davis, now Katie Davis Majors. She wrote one of my favorite books called Kisses from Katie. That's the title of her book. In her book, she begins her life story with these words. Jesus wrecked my life, shattered it to pieces, then put it back together more beautifully. She had plans. Katie was going to marry her high school sweetheart. The two of them had plans to build a life together. In her senior year of high school, 17-year-old Katie goes with a mission trip to Uganda, Africa. Her heart was broken for the children there. She was caught in this turmoil of all of the things that we live in, all the splendor we live in, and the sparse lives of those people in Africa. She came home and couldn't get over it. She and her boyfriend, they had plans, but God had other plans. 19 years old in 2008, she moves to Uganda and adopts 14 orphan girls. Now her and her now husband are raising their youngster in this home. She had plans for her life. God had another plan. In chapter 1 of Luke's gospel, God tells us that God sent the angel Gabriel to deliver a message to Mary. He says, you're highly favored. He says, you're going to have a baby boy. You're going to name him Jesus. I don't know what plans she had. This is God's plan. He will be the son of God. He will sit on David's throne. His kingdom will stand forever. I'm sure we can't imagine this. But we can imagine she was probably a little bit confused. We can imagine she's probably like, what? And in her confusion, she says, that can't be. I'm a virgin. How can this be? Gabriel responds, and I'm going to read this. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Scripture is pretty clear. Mary responds with a yes. I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said come true. Now that's a picture of faith. That's what true belief looks like. An unexpected visitor with an unbelievable claim to a very unlikely person. Mary doesn't seem to flinch. She just says, okay, I'll live this faith-filled life in obedience to what God has for me. You know, that's one of the great mysteries of our faith. Conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. That means God became human, truly human, out of his own grace. The miracle of the birth of Jesus. The Son of God coming down from heaven. Jesus, the man came from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, and came from Mary. 
Mary's baby boy, son of God, son of man. You know, Jesus is not only God. He is human in every way, just like us. Without limitations, not similar to us, just like you and me in every way. The birth of Jesus is a fact of history. The man Jesus walked in the Middle East a couple of thousand years ago, he taught around the Sea of Galilee. The statement that he was born of the Virgin, that's an affirmation of faith. Birth is normal, we know that. Birth of a virgin? Wouldn't we consider that impossible? God having a son, conceived not by man, but by the Holy Spirit. This young teenage Jewish girl is pregnant and still a virgin. And you know, we can't prove this, not by scientific method, but we can believe it. It can be trusted. The Apostles' Creed, our statement of faith, is anchored in faith, and it's anchored through real historic events. Now, for the past three years, we've been told to embrace a new normal. Everyone glad to hear that? Anyone as sick of hearing that as I am? Talk about a new normal. This miracle of the birth of Christ ushers in for the world a new normal. Nothing is impossible with God. Our statement of faith. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Nothing is impossible with God. Mary herself knew that to conceive a child in this way took a miracle. It would take a miracle. And that's exactly what we got. Jesus, the son of God, and the Son of Man, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Three names. I mentioned there's three names mentioned in the Apostles' Creed. Jesus, Mary, and Pontius Pilate, the forever bad guy. He's the villain. For all these ages, everyone recites his name. He's the bad guy. You know, he tried to avoid it. First, he tried to release him. This man where he finds no fault. When that didn't work, he says, okay, I'll wash my hands of this. Blames it on the people. That didn't get him out of it either. For 2,000 years, we've been reciting his name as the bad guy. Nothing could get him off the hook. I think it's kind of ironic that one of his soldiers is one of the first people to make this creedal statement. This man truly was the son of God at the base of the cross. And you know, just because Jesus suffered un under Pontius Pilate, and that's historically true, it was our sin that put him there. It was our sin that got him there. He went to that cross because of your sin and mine. A long time ago, Athanasius wrote his treatise on the Incarnation. He explains that by suffering his body to death, Christ abolished death for people. Human beings set free from sin and death because Jesus offered his sinless, perfect human body to atone for the sins of the world. Jesus' suffering, his crucifixion, his death, and his burial demonstrated that he was a real man with a physical human body, a body that could bleed beaten, abused by those Roman soldiers. A body that could collapse under exhaustion as he carried that cross. A body that could die. A body that could die and be buried in that tomb. Killed under the direction of Pontius Pilate. He was a real human being. And that was critical. That was necessary. 
because the perfect justice of a holy God required a genuine human sacrifice to atone for the sins of humanity. This wasn't an accident. It was the plan all along. It wasn't plan B, God's intention from the beginning. It couldn't just be anyone, but it had to be the perfect, sinless son of man. Chapter 2 of Hebrews makes it very, very clear that Jesus had to be flesh and blood, a physical human being, to atone for our sins. He who had no sin was made sin for our sake, yours and mine. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He suffered in our place. He paid the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be saved, so that we could be justified to God, made fit to spend eternity, the one true holy God. We've been studying the Apostles' Creed on Sunday nights. We meet in the Fellowship Hall at 6. We gather for Holy Communion, and then we jump into the Creed. We're using this study guide by uh, Dr. Tennant, This We Believe. And in this study guide last week, we read this example, a paraphrase. It said, Jesus dying in our place is one of the most powerful truths of the Christian faith. Christ died on the cross as a substitute for you and for me. He took our place. We are sinners, and the wages of sin is death. And we've been sentenced to death for our sins. Dr. Tennant says, it's like we brought in cuffs out of the courtroom into the execution chamber, strapped in, prepared to die. And suddenly we get word that the very judge that found us guilty made arrangements for his son to die in our place as a substitute. 1 Corinthians 15.3 for what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried. This is the scriptural source for this language of the creed. Every phrase of the Apostles' Creed comes directly out of scripture. Jesus died for our sins as a substitute. Jesus died so we won't taste that second death, that spiritual death. Do you know this idea of Christ dying for our sins? It's out of style in America today. We were talking about this in Sunday school this morning. People don't want to hear this. I have a new version. Christ is mistakenly described as coming to add to our goodness, to enhance our good qualities, rather than to redeem us at our worst. Sadly, people these days are not interested in a savior. They want to find their own way, looking for a do-it-yourself way, picking and choosing from various beliefs that affirm what they want to hear, wanting to earn their way into heaven, to be rewarded for their good works and continually affirmed along the way. Not the life-changing kind of works we talked about with Katie Davis. That'd be too much. Giving up too much of what we have, we cling to our lifestyle as if we're entitled to it. But God offers abundant life. But in the world today, people don't want to hear it. We don't like to hear about sin. We don't like to hear about salvation. We talked about this on Sunday night as well. People don't like to hear about sin. When done, someone does something bad, we play it off as a sickness. Or there's some extenuating circumstance, something that happened along the way in their life. There's no accountability for our actions. No one is regarded as a sinner anymore. We cringe and we roll our eyes. We talk about personified evil. The scripture is very clear. Satan 
prowling around, roaring like a lion out there, seeking to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Christianity is at odds with our culture. We proclaim biblical truths. I want to share a few from the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. There is no one righteous, not even one. Verse 23. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Chapter 5, verse 8. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the good news of the cross. This is the heart of the gospel message. Christ's atoning sacrifice for us, for you, and for me on the cross at Calvary. This is what we believe. This defines who we are. We believe in the suffering servant, the Son of God, the Son of Man. Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Christ came all the way to where we are while we were yet sinners. This we believe. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Lord, you came down to earth to save us. You are our Savior. You are our Lord. You said that all things are possible for those who believe. Lord, we believe in you and in your great love. You're the creator of heaven and earth. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. And Lord, we pray, help our unbelief. Deliver us into your righteous hands. Amen.